Hello everyone and welcome to the Beauty Matters with me Len Hossein. Today we are joined by London-based leading fashion designer Omar Mansour. Omar is best known for his couture occasion wear. His designs are regularly showcased at London Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week and Bahrain Fashion Week as well as grazing the pages of magazines such as Vogue. Hello, Omar. Hello, Lynn. Thank you very much for inviting me to your show. Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. Pleasure indeed for me. So, Omar, tell me uh, about your design method. Uh, what is, is it like from feeling or ideas or uh, material? So what comes first? First of all, we have to do the trend forecasting that for which season I'm going to make the collection for let's say if it's spring summer so the fabric has to be light airy wearable for summers and uh, even for resort wear when because most of the clients go for their holidays uh, during summers mm -hmm. so i have to think about the fabric in that case then there's always a muse that which muse i have to work upon let's say if it's uh, inspired by a um, famous personality so I have to do a research and study about that personality mm -hmm. how she was how he was or how they used to live what was their personal style so there's a whole research around the muse and then we do the cuts and embellishment regardingly so there's like a 33% trend forecasting 33% muse and rest of the 34% is it's interesting that you need to know more about the person to be able to design for that person, like individual pieces? If it's a muse, then obviously, uh, let's say I'm doing a collection uh, from the British theatre play after the dance. Mm -hmm. So obviously I have to go and watch that theatre play first. Yeah. I have to understand the set uh, while making the set, what was in the behind their mind, the set design, I discuss with the costume designers. What? Why do they select those colors for the costume to make a whole impact on mm. the audience? And why actors were wearing certain wigs and what exactly the lighting of the set? So you have to understand the whole concept and aura of the muse. Uh, Omar, you uh, close royalty. What an honor, first. And uh, what are the considerations when you are doing so? Uh, first of all, whenever I meet a royalty, I don't keep it in my mind that uh, it's a royalty and I have to be over courteous. Mm. So they being themselves and I've been myself, so it's always more of a client versus uh, the designer relationship, which is even yeah. more casual. I'll just quote you an example as you speak. It reminds in 2012, actually, one of the royalty, Middle Eastern royalty, she came to the studio for an appointment slightly late but she came on a cycle rickshaw and uh, i was waiting for her assuming there will be a car coming stopping off outside the studio okay, <laughs> there was cycle rickshaw. yeah so they yeah. were uh, having uh, cruising around the town and <laughs> they asked the same cycle rickshaw to bring them to the, my studio so <laughs> yeah. can you name me some um, royalty you work quite with? a few there's a european royalty there's middle eastern royalty yeah. who have been buying and wearing my dresses uh, yeah we are talking now about uh, middle eastern ladies um how different it is when you're designing for middle eastern lady in comparison to a western lady uh there, there is definitely a difference of culture and obviously the, the religious boundaries so obviously the modesty factor is considered when a middle eastern client is there so for the unmodest side, I have to always ask them questions. How much deep we can take the neckline? Mm. Would they want uh, sheer fabric or they want lining underneath? Mm. Do they want sleeves, half sleeves, three quarter belt sleeves? Mm. So we always discuss that factor and do they need lining underneath the sleeves or the sheer sleeves can work in their family or atmosphere or the function they're gonna attend. And sometimes they are attending an all women function, it's ladies only. And mm. they can wear anything. So mm. they say, yeah, make it like this, make it deep neck, backlash, something. And because there won't be any male around. So there is a consideration of always the culture and the religion for Middle Eastern clients when I'm making for yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, I know that you are from a family that have a background related to fashion. Uh, can you tell me more about it? Yeah, coming from a textile background, so from a textilian family. My great-grandfather was into uh, making thread for the rugs. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was into selling rugs and weaving rugs business. And my father was into spinning and exporting the thread. 
So, and other relatives were into weaving the fabric and printing the fabric. So, I decided to go to the last end, <laughs> the yeah. stitching the fabric. <laughs> yeah. So, that's how, I mean, I come from a family, usually in Asian backgrounds. Uh, the grandmother or the father will never ask you, oh, I wish you work in a fashion, you become a designer or you become a fashion journalist. In my era in the 90s when I was growing, I was born in 80s but grew up in 90s. <laughs> so that was the time when the grandmothers or the elders of the family used to say, oh, I wish you become a doctor, engineer or uh, accountant. <laughs> so there, this, these were the three fields where people were yeah. f focusing to. <laughs> and if somebody was too modern, then maybe a pilot. Yeah. But yeah, with me, it was very clear. Okay, if you do whatever you want to do. Yeah, it's a family business. You want to go to the value addition. So you want to get into the ready-made garment side. So instead of using the word fashion designer, I was using the word garments and stitched garments. That's the only difference. But I was fully encouraged from the family and support was there. That's great. Uh, you have been involved in London Fashion Week for now. Um, Omar Mansour corrected me before we start. I say 12, you think it's 14 now. <laughs> so it's 14 uh, times you've been involved in London Fashion Week. Um, we know how competitive this industry is. Uh, what do you think like uh, make you stand out or um, like being able to work in this competitive industry? Um, yeah, I would definitely agree with the fact that fashion is a very competitive and mm. sometimes even cutthroat industry when it comes to uh, showcase your collection with all your friends and frenemies on the same platform. Uh, I think with me, because I uh, stick to my design ethos from day one. So there was a uh, concept of fusing East and West, uh, my kind of embroideries from my, where I grew up, where I was born, that part of the world to the part I moved to. So there was a collage of uh, uh, design elements mm. which came out as a uniqueness for me so I stick to my side and the other people stick to their side and we all are good happy go lucky friends <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I saw some photos from uh, London Fashion Week 2000 uh, 18 yes. uh, it was um, the red shade was like um, very lively as well um, is there a, like a story behind it or how you came about uh, choosing um, the red color for your collection there's an icon behind it grace coddington mm. the welsh supermodel veteran supermodel and uh, ex uh, editor of vogue us so she used to have she still have red locks red hair so this whole collection mm. was around her her personality her lifestyle and the red color was taken from her red hair color. Okay, so <laughs> it's, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, now we talked about years uh, back, like your background. If we are going to talk about five years from now or ten years from now, mm -hmm. how Omar Mansour um, sees himself? Uh, I think I'll be making a sub brand into ready to wear, which will be ethically fashion so sourced fashion. So it could be more around the ethical fashion forum and the way there will be less wastage and it will be separate label than the couture and high end label. It will be more affordable and more uh, uh, trendy and uh, targeted towards the youngsters and masses. Is it uh, difficult as your clients varies like in, the, in terms of cultures and um, different backgrounds? Is it, is it comp like challenging for you or you got used to it now? <laughs> <laughs> Here I'll give you an example of the amount of yeah. coffees that I have in my studio. So in the morning it could be coming up an uh, English lady, uh, let's say one of my uh, clients uh, she is a high court judge so she comes for a power woman power suit power jackets and skirts so and she wants fabrics which are very uh, stiff uh, enhance her personality and because uh, she has to make an impact and persona even outside her job that she is a judge for at the court so for her it would be an english breakfast tea i'll be serving asking her and we'll be drinking together after she finished her appointment, the next appointment could be a Turkish client coming in yeah. or somebody from Uzbekistan. As we call my team, call them Stans. <laughs> so it's maybe Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, any of this uh, uh, Central Asian 
Yeah, uh, what they call them? Stunts. Stunts, yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. So, <laughs> a short. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that would be, we'll be drinking something like uh, green tea or some of the stani tea. <laughs> yeah, so you have, uh, you prepare all, uh, all what people need, <laughs> exactly. requirements. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, uh, my assistant who attend the um, clients in, uh, when they entered, so she always knew. If it's a Chinese client, let's bring the <laughs> matcha tea. And so they're going to offer them only that tea plus English breakfast as Interesting. an option. Interesting. So you have all of that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you feel like that this client is coming from a very um, conservative background. So she may be asking something which is very modest. But it turns out to be that, no, they are attending a different kind of function and they have a separate lifestyle. Every country has a separate, mm. uh, what you call, fashionable class. Whoever, uh, I would call this separate socio-economic class. So there's economy, what they afford, and there's a society where they mingle around. Mm. So when you mix that socio-economic, there would be people going to balls where they wear uh, backless dresses, even uh, in a strictly Islamic country also. Mm. So there were close parties and they want to wear something over there. Mm. And they won't find it that in their country. So when they travel to London, they want something baseball. So yeah, but at the same time, there would be a Western lady coming to you. Uh, one of the uh, lady who works for a very big publication as a fashion editor, mm -hmm. she always wears uh, modest clothing. So she always asks me for full sleeves, high est. <laughs> I always say, why don't you ask me to put a high neck than a turtle neck? So very high necklines and full length dresses. So that's her. And she's young. She's actually my age. And so I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself younger. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, people, she lives in London. She was brought up in um, North London, went to uh, what you call uh, um, all, uh, all girls school. But she, that's her style that she, she doesn't feel it's comfortable. It's a personal choice. Exactly. So yeah. that's, uh, we can't stereotype. But that's what I learned. That if a lady coming from Africa, she doesn't necessarily looking for uh, wax prints or something. Yeah. So when people go to a couture, usually they want something which is very exclusive based book in their mind. You uh, took me to my uh, next question. How how important <clears throat> for the woman to feel comfortable in what she's wearing? Like the link between what she's wearing and um, how confident she is. Um, like how the link between our outfit and how we behave and how we how confident we are really. A dress is all about enhancing your personality. Mm. Something which is in back of your mind, which people can't see but they can read uh, while having conversation with you uh, a dress communicates your personality even before you open your mouth even before you communicate yeah. your dressing communicates your styling communicates so it's all about lifestyle some people have birthmarks they don't want to show it. they're not comfortable showing it mm -hmm. so they want sometimes sleeves till their elbow that there is something a mark they don't want to feel mm -hmm. like uh, publicizing it and the same time, there are some people who feel like that, let it be. Mm. I'm proud of my marks. So uh, it depends upon how comfortable they are in the back of their mind. If they are not comfortable, then the couture is useless. It can't enhance their personality. It further confuses their personality. Mm. It confusing. It takes away their confidence. Those, either they go over the confident or they are underconfident, okay. but they are not at the par where they should be. Okay. So uh, sometimes some mothers come with their daughters and they say, I want her to wear this. And I always say, yeah, let me hear what she wants to be. And she always says, actually, I want this, but mother doesn't allow <laughs> me. So, <laughs> so this yeah. always you have to balance it out in a diplomatic way, what exactly the wearer has to wear rather than what the mom wants, mom wants to, yeah. want to wear. Uh, what's the impact of social media and fashion these days? I think it has made fashion as fast fashion now. People just see something here, a celebrity wearing, they want to go online and buy it straight away. And with Instagram now, you just click on a photo and it opens a link to the website where you can actually buy. Yeah. So it's less than 10 seconds to make the decision. It's impulsive buying, it's fast fashion. It, it's also leading to the unhealthy side of the fashion, which is the more disposable fashion mm. people don't want to be tagged in a photo more than three in a dress for more than three four times yeah. they say oh i'm already been tagged in it it's i went to that party people have seen people who didn't attend that party has seen photos from that party mm. so it's a plus point that yeah people have seen the dress and the negative side is that people the wearer doesn't want it to be repeated again and get comments that oh i hope 
I think this dress suits you a lot. That's why you keep on wearing it and repeating it. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a pressure. It's a pressure. It's a pressure. Mm -hmm. It's it's an it's good for the designer, but it's unhealthy for the consumer side. Okay. Yeah. So impulsive buying and fast fashion has came ahead. People buy the clothes. Sometimes they don't even wash them. They discard them. Give them to charity shop, or, yeah. which is not something which we were doing ten years back. Yeah. And this unhealthy trend is going ahead. <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, I've met you in UK Top Model, uh, and I wore one of your amazing dresses. <laughs> uh, Thank this you. dress displayed in London Fashion Week 2018, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and now, are you involved in London Fashion Week uh, September 1, 2019? Yes, it would be great to have you there again and watch the show. Yeah, that's something. Uh, I will um, do my best to be with Omar Mansoor and we'll um, do another interview with you if we can. Oh, after, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell me a little bit like just for ALB UK and Beauty Matters about uh, your involvement in London Fashion Week this year? Uh, what uh, you mean to know what kind of collection? Like collection, yeah. Okay, uh, this color is a color which every woman likes to wear and it suits many skin tones. Yeah. And it's a, again bright and elegant color for anyone from 17 years old to 70 years old can wear it. Wow. And uh, yeah, there is a bird factor in the collection. It's, uh, I'm used around a bird, a bird with very colorful uh, wings. So keep an eye. <laughs> yeah, and we will uh, will be with Omar Mansoor and uh, we'll definitely uh, cover uh, London Fashion Week with you. Thank you very much. Um, so Omar Mansoor, you, are, you made a big name. What drives your success? What do you think is behind your success? Well, I think uh, <laughs> there is huge amount of hours which we work, which is hard work. But hard then hard work, work is something I think everyone do it. Uh, it's the dedication and it's the goal setting that you make your goals every year that by the end of the year it's not just a new year night I'll be celebrating on 31st but these are the things I have to achieve these are the shows or these are the clients I have to achieve this much sales I have to achieve so uh, I think that and at the same time there are my elders mother and brothers supporting and praying for me I have good clients good friends who are always there to support me so. Yeah, you deserve it all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, Omar, what's uh, the age group you mostly w work with? Uh, that's a very interesting question, actually. To me, there comes brides, mm -hmm. uh, bridemaids, mother of bride, and sometimes the granny of the bride also. Okay. So, they all want a dress um, for the bride. Obviously, it's like a whole whole project. So, you do bridal dresses? Uh, yes, made to order. I don't do a collection in bridal, but mm -hmm. uh, I have done quite a few uh, made to order bridals. Mm -hmm. So, brides who want specific kind of look with more embroidery, intricacy, and sometimes a bride wants the same, uh, the venue or some element from uh, the venue the in her same. dress, mm -hmm. or some jewelry element embroidered on the dress, so, or some story from the family, such a sign or some religious sign. Mm -hmm. uh, on their dress so yeah we do it embroidery and uh, in the appliques etc and uh, at the same time the mother of brides are even sometimes more demanding than the bride so okay. yeah, yeah i got quite a few mother of brides and uh, so you nearly work with all ages you can say. yes exactly yeah. uh, i must uh, accept that <laughs> sometime <laughs> i got a client who is 20 years old and the mother is 40 or 42 and then the grandmother is 60 66 so and all the generations yes but three of them are equally demanding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can't get away with that factor that okay i'm 60 plus so i don't want to dress sometimes she say I, this is the jewelry pendant which i got from my wedding i want to wear it on my granddaughter's wedding yeah so can you embroider this pendant around this dress and we discussed her dress separately we make a separate pattern for the grandmother for the mother of pride it's something for her it's another big day in her life that after getting married it's a daughter getting married so her excitement mm. her sentiments can't be overshadowed by the bride so i sometimes like to keep the three appointments separate so they don't interfere yeah. to each other yeah. and they can tell about themselves so it's always so it's a fun. challenging no matter what age oh exactly <laughs> <laughs> sometimes with the addition of age the challenge goes even challenging more, more. interesting yeah. Um, if I, if you will look back to Omar Mansour when um, you started, mm -hmm. um, now um, you reached 
um, most of your goals mm -hmm. and I wish you all the success in the future. Thank you. But if you look back to you when you started, what advice you will give yourself? Uh, I would definitely tell myself that instead of hearing what's going here or there, do your own search and do more s stuff which actually sell rather than what the people want to see or they want to comment about. Because at the end of the day, is the client who is actually buying and wearing your dress matters mm -hmm. rather than those fashionistas and those uh, etcetera's who just come and make comments at your shows and collection. Oh, I didn't like it, but did you ever buy it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Will you ever wear it? Yeah. So why should we have bothered? So wearability and sales are the main factor which drive the whole, any kind of business. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when it comes to my kind of business, obviously, then I should be more sales driven rather than <laughs> impact driven. Yeah. So. Um, I have uh, read an article where people have been saying, um, like, is it a display uh, collection or is it a sales collection? Is there a difference on that? Like, is there a display collection where the designer, um, like, designs a collection only for display or it's like kind of a mix between the two, a display and sale? It depends what, how many lines does the designer have. Sometimes yeah. through a show, you want to just communicate your creativity and your concepts that what's your uh, creative thought is all about, what's your design aesthetic is all about. Mm. Then you do a creative collection, which is not wearable at all anywhere, on the, even on the grannies or mm. uh, Academy Awards, you can't wear them. Uh, maybe at the Met Gala. <laughs> so, I, but that's where the design is not communicating the wearability. So mm. if you see a model wearing an aerospace kind of suit and walking, then this showing that the designer is looking toward the modern, or future or mm. something in the space. But then at the end of the day, they're gonna print that same concept, digital print on the t-shirt and sell that t-shirt. Mm. So the client will know, the buyer will know, okay, it's a wearable t-shirt right? and it's coming from that concept, from that specific show, from that specific fashion week. But that's not the wearable collection. So it's adopted trickle down to wearability. Mm. But sometimes the idea is not to sell, like if you're doing a fuchsia whole collection, which is all, uh, see through or something not wearable mm. but very dramatic very impactful because at the end of the day the fuchsia is coming as their lipstick next color and they have a makeup line and they want to sell that specific color in the eye shades and the lipstick and nail polishes so they're mm. going to make all the sales and the mm. revenue from the makeup by showing it on the catwalk in terms of the garments okay. so it's always what's the vision of the designer and what's the vision of the company behind the show and behind the collection. Like, I want to talk about the consideration you take from a client who's going to Royal Ascot and a client who's going to Academy Award. Um, how different it is for you as a designer? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is actually different, especially as you mentioned Royal Ascot. It's mm. been 10th year I've been collections for the Ascot. Royal Ascot 2019 collection was the latest. Mm. Uh, Ascot has its own dress code so we have to follow those codes and those guidelines we can't go beyond that so a dress couldn't be above the knees uh, yeah. it can't show the midriff if it's a two-piece dress it has to be same fabric same color same shade yeah uh, the strap of the dress shouldn't be less than 1.5 inches so these are the guidelines which we follow uh, strictly especially for the royal enclosure so else there will be fashion police around who will give you a shawl to drape and you have to cover yourself with a scarf which you don't want, I assume. Yeah. So with Escort, uh, there are limited um, guidelines which you have to work alone. So your patterns have to be around that, keeping in mind the target uh, clientele and their physique. But when it comes to Academy Awards, <laughs> obviously it's more glamoroma <laughs> and more uh, canvas to play with more personalities, uh, there's too much you can do with it and mm. still get away with it. At the Ascot, you cannot. Yeah, so it's uh, kind of restricted. Well, as I mentioned, the word fashion police, the fashion police is both. Fashion uh, police. Yes. <laughs> so at the Ascot, it has to make you strict to the guidelines. And yeah. The, uh, uh, Academy Awards, the fashion police is there to write if you are flamboyant or not. Mm -hmm. So it's both, both events have a separate kind of roles by the fashion police. In regards to your clients, when they come um, and want like um, to explain a type of dress, for example, she wants, does she like give you a stitch or 
do they leave it completely to you to choose the color and the design? Or? Uh, uh, every client has a separate story actually. Different, yeah. <laughs> yeah, most of the clients, I f prefer those who have something clear in their mind. So we start sketching and they start guiding. Mm. Sometimes they bring different swatches, different cutouts from different magazines since their childhood, which they want all of them in one dress. Mm. So it becomes more challenging and I have to convince them that only certain <laughs> things can put be. It all together. <laughs> exactly. So, but then there come some clients who are traveling in some uh, part of, uh, of the world and then they find a very unique fabric which was hand woven which was hand dyed indigo dyed and <clears throat> this and that and they bought that and now they want to dress out of it and the dress should be the dress of their dreams so okay. every client discuss their issues their demands in a separate way it's all about knowing sometimes you have to tell them ma'am you have a separate kind of pl physique or a big r glass physique uh, this cut won't uh, go on your physique at all it yeah. will complement your personality and sometimes they get so stuck that say no but i want it so there is always a diplomatic challenge so we yeah. are always <laughs> you always give them your advice exactly obviously even in colors yes obviously <laughs> because uh, it's not that the color which i am making my collection for the season i want everyone to wear that no mm -hmm. when you're coming for a base book outfit you can ask for any color if you like, but does that yeah. color suit you yeah, or yeah. does it? Sometimes a woman came, she said, I want a lilac dress because I have a lilac Birkin bag. Okay, how about we make a dark purple dress and put some lilac embroidery so that the bag will also be more enhanced. So does the embroidery will, there will be lilac element as well as uh, something which suits your skin tone also. Because yeah. lilac is not a color which every skin color can suit. Suit, yeah. yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Omar Mansour, for being with me today. I have a special thank for Omar Mansour because you invited me to London Fashion Week 2018. It was a great experience. Good, thank and you. Uh, I can't wait to come and uh, see the fashion show in uh, September 2019. And hopefully, um, I will try to cover as much as I can from it. Perfect. Looking forward. I'm very looking forward to it as well. Thanks a lot for being with me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Lynn. Thank you.